ערב טוב לכולם. <coughs> התפקיד שהוטל עליי הוא להציג את הדוברים במושב הראשון. נתחיל באחד והמיוחד והוא לו לנארד. לו לנארד איש מחל, טייס קרב במלחמת העולם השנייה. כשפרצה מלחמת השחרור וצבאות ערב החלו לזרום מכל העברים נקרא לו לנארד לדגל והתייצב מיד. הוא בא מאמריקה. לו היה מוביל הרביעייה שהפציצה את גשר עד הלום ב-29 במאי 48' ועצרה את הפלישה המצרית לישראל במלחמת העצמאות. ברביעייה היו לפי הסדר לו לנארד המוביל, מודי אלון שהיה מפקד הראשון של טייסט 101, דרך אגב הוא עצמו נהרג זמן קצר אחרי זה, עזר ויצמן ואדי כהן, גם הוא איש מחל, אדי נפל בגיחה זו. <coughs> דרך אגב, ה-29 ה- במאי נחשב מאז ועד היום לתאריך הקמתה של טייסת 101 היא טייסת הקרב הראשונה. לו לנארד הוא בן 91, דרך אגב מכל ערביה הוא נמצא איתנו היחידי. כמובן שהשלושה ושעזר גם נפטר אתם יודעים. ציוני וממש שריד לטייסי המחל ולמורשת חיל האוויר. <coughs> היה, מיועד, היה מיודד עם יצחק שדה, הפיק סרטים בארץ ובאמריקה, לו לנארד חי לסירוגין בישראל ובארצות הברית. נושא הרצאתו, כיצד הובלתי רביעייה לבלימת הצבא המצרי בגשר עד הלום, 1948. <coughs> עוד הערה קטנה. גשר על, עד הלום, וכשהם תקפו זה לא נקרא גשר עד הלום. אחרי התקפה ועצרו את הזה, התחילו לקרוא לזה גשר עד הלום. לא, הוציאו. קודם כל, סליחה, העברית שלי לא מספיק טוב, so excuse me if I do it in English. First, uh, <coughs> first of all, I want to thank uh, Dr. Yossi Leshem for the honor of inviting me here to meet with you. Now, he also suggested that I should tell you a little bit, since I'm the only one left alive, it's my duty, my Miloim job to pass the word on to the future generations. So uh, I'll do that a little bit. Anybody have any questions after? I'm available. Now, uh, so I thank you. And uh, all I could tell you is this was the Air Force in 1948. <laughs> See it? Four people. And uh, It was very desperate times. We had almost nothing. The enemy had everything. But in the end, we won. So that was pretty good. But uh, the, the, there was no squadron. There was nothing. There was just the four of us. And these little airplanes uh, were being put together. It was junk. It was stuff that the German Air Force left behind in Czechoslovakia. So it was a very, very bad airplane. <laughs> And uh, you know, I'm try- not trying not to lose my thought. OK, people ask me often, what was the origin? How did this great, mighty Air Force get started? And especially the young pilots. So I tell them, with, the, uh, with just these four, that's, that was the start of the Air Force. Now, the quest- other question is, How is it possible to win? And the other one is, why did I come here? I had spent seven years in the Marine Corps, 
And of course, out of the four of us, I'm the only one that pulled the trigger in war. And uh, I had a lot of experience in, in the Pacific in combat flying. But uh, how did I get here? Well, we had nothing. The, the war of the Arabs against the Jews, as I tell people, started not 48, 100 years before that. So uh, there was a desperate need here for airplanes to drop supplies to the different settlements that were under, uh, under fire and also to pick up wounded. And all we had here then was just a few Piper Cubs. So the Haganah bought a thing called uh, a Norseman, which is a single engine uh, canvas oven over wood airplane with four seats, was made to fly 500 miles. That's all we had. And uh, the problem was that from Italy where I found it. First of all, I'd never flown one before. I'd never even heard of one. Well, luckily, the guy with me, Coley Goldstein, knew about it. So uh, the problem was, how do you get this little airplane to go 1,300 miles? Because obviously, we couldn't land anywhere. The whole world was against us, obviously. You couldn't even bring a pistol in here, no less an airplane, and we couldn't land anywhere. So that was probably, of all the combat flying I've flown in World War II, this was probably the most dangerous thing I did. We had, as I say, this watching one propeller spinning around for 11 and a half hours nonstop because we had taken out the seats, put a big rubber tank in there to, to try to get here. 11 and a half hours. That was scary. For all that time, never saw, we never got higher than 1,000 feet, never saw another airplane, never saw a ship, never saw land, nothing. If uh, the engine would cough once, that's the end of it. Anyhow, we made it. And uh, there was no, they, they told me that there's a, a power station and to look for towers. So we found it, and as we're circling on fumes, uh, the, ja the Arabs from J uh, Jaffa were firing at us. Well, that was the beginning of the, not the Air Force, but bringing that little airplane here. I wouldn't do it today for a million dollars to try it. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. It doesn't work. The, the, the oil can was about the size of a shoebox. Can you imagine that? Going for 11 and a half hours. Anyhow, got here and that was, somebody else took it over. Uh, within a week, I was in Czechoslovakia. Nobody would give us airplanes. Nobody would send us airplanes. There was a wonderful man called Al Schwimmer who started everything about uh, uh, in, in Los Angeles to buy surplus airport, air, aircraft. So as a veteran, I was given $5,000. I went down there and I bought a, a C-46. I don't know if you that knows what that means. It's a big transport plane. And it was Al's genius that did it because before we got anything else, we needed something to bring in arms from Czechoslovakia, which is the only place that would buy, we can buy things because the communists took over and they needed <laughs> dollars. So the long story is we, I'm here. Now, every day we're being bombed because we didn't even have an anti-aircraft gun. Now, the interesting thing is that to bring the airplanes here, because the the range of the so-called ME was 55 minutes. So obviously you couldn't land anyway and you couldn't bring it. They took it all apart in pieces. They came in the, in the C-46s and uh, came to Ekron. I think it was called Ekron then. Right, so there were, the interesting thing is how we luck out. But by the way, my whole life is based on Goral, destiny. I have no idea why or how I survived all, evaded Hitler, wound up uh, surviving the Japanese and all the bullets, I, except once I wound up with, uh, uh, being hit and I, had to, I was blown out of a fighter plane at 100 meters, so it took me two months in the hospital and they said I'll never fly again. No, I wouldn't accept it. And the bottom line is we wound up in Czechoslovakia 
It was the worst airplane I've ever, it's not an airplane. I mean, it was, it was crazy. And uh, most of our problems in getting killed was from that airplane. There was no rudder trim. It was a different engine. It was a different propeller. It was two guns firing through the prop. I mean, it just, it just didn't work. So I was the, since I was the senior and the only one with most experience of the five of us, why uh, I took off first. Well, that's the first time I almost got killed in it because it was a wide field. You couldn't see anything and, and the tail was down. Bottom line is I saw in the distance, I, I zeroed in on the cloud. By the time I put the, the full throttle, tail up, the plane went 45 minutes and I went right past the hangar, jumped over a fence, just panicked over and that's how I took off on the first, first flight on that piece of junk. I, bottom line is I had about two, three flights in it. The other guy, Azer and Modi Alon and um, uh, Eddie Cohn. And, and at that time we heard Ben Gurion announce on the uh, radio of the state. And uh, so we went to the commander of the Czech air base and said, listen, we gotta go back. Because every day the Spitfires that the Egyptian Air Force had, which incidentally Great Britain who was about as bad as the Nazis were in those days. I called it, now it's England, which is what they deserve. Anyhow, they gave the Egyptians 40 brand new Spitfires, 40 of them. So the problem, I, when, when, we, when we went to the commander of the Czech Air Force, they said, look, we gotta go back. These guys are bombing Tel Aviv every day. They'd come over at about 2,000 feet, drop the bombs, and then strafe the streets. So uh, the question is, he asked me, well, what are you gonna do? You're only four of you and there's 40 of them. So I thought, well, first of all, let's get there. So the thing was taken off. It took four airplanes to bring the four uh, Emmys. Uh, then at Ekron, there were two hangars. Now who knew how to put this thing together? So we brought a Czech mechanic with us couple of Israelis and an American guy, Axelrod, that's right, that was his name. And now all the four pieces of the four airplanes were in this, this hangar and the other hangar was empty. When the Egyptians came over, they always bombed that one. Always empty. I mean, you figure it out, you can't. And here we were being put together now, I'm gonna take a little quick little drink and I will, we get to the hot stuff. <laughs> All right, we're faced now, we got four airplanes. Then we're thinking, we're sitting together, the four of us, Azer, Modi, Alon, and Eddie Cohn. Eddie Cohn was, uh, well, there were, Eddie Cohn was a pure, well, it's hard to talk about him because I lost them all. But uh, we were sitting around, oh, we have a squadron. We have four airplanes. We have to have a name. So uh, Monday alone suggested Scorpion. And so I, it didn't just gel. And, and the Americans, they use all kinds of risque names that they put on their airplanes. So I don't want to take credit for it, but there were two guys, new Machalniks that came that were art students at UCLA. So I'm trying to fall asleep and I think, I can't relate to the, uh, what Moti said, the, the um, what did I say it was, not this, uh, it's, uh, score, yeah, couldn't relate to it. So I think back, wait a minute, the last time we had a problem with the Egyptians was when Moses was trying to take the Jews out. Now, what happened? There were 10, ten plagues, nine of them didn't work. The 10th, worked. That's how we got the, the insignia of the Air Force, the Malach HaMoved, the angels of death. And I figured if we don't shoot them down, maybe we'll scare them to death because we had it painted all over the place. All right, so now, now we get to, all right, what do you do with it? 
my thought was, I, mean, I was 26 years old then. I mean, what would I know? All I had to worry about in, in all the combat in the Pacific was just my own life. Here I was worried about a lot more things. So the thing was, is what are we going to do? So it was the four of us, and there was really no command structure in those days. We were the four of us, didn't even have us. We're sitting in the ground there outside the hangar. And I thought, wow, the only chance we have is if we get down to El Arish at first light, at dawn, and try to get him on the ground. Now, we couldn't test fly the airplanes. You know, when you, when you even just do a little job on an airplane, on an engine, you have to test flight. We couldn't fire the gun, nothing. We couldn't do anything. It was put together, painted, and that's where it was. Now, the plan was on the 30th to go down to El Arish and try to hit him on the ground and try to destroy as many as we could. Now it's about 4.35 p.m. of the 29th. The airplanes were there in the hangar, tail to nose. Uh, Shimon Avidan, I don't know if any of you guys know who he was. Uh, what? Gibati. He and his deputy drive up, they heard that there were airplanes. And he said to me, he says, listen, the whole Egyptian army is six miles away from where we're standing. He's standing with me outside the hangar. I'd never met him before. He said, well, I met him a lot later on. Anyhow, he sa I, I said, well, oh, he says, well, we bombed part of, uh, part of the bridge enough to hold them up. So they're parked bumper to bumper as far as the eye could see. And if we don't stop them tonight, they'll be in Tel Aviv tomorrow morning. Well, the decision was easy. Of course. I mean, there was no, there was no hesitation. I looked at Azer and Modi Alon and Eddie Kuhn and I said, look, I know we didn't test fly, we didn't do anything. Here's what I want you to do. I want all of you, I'm going to take off first. I'll do a circle. I want you to join up on me, and I want you to be in front with me. And like this, not in trail, in front. Because whenever we're going to attack them, they're going to aim for me, number one, and they'll hit number four if you're not up forward. Well, unfortunately, that's what happened. Now, we're sitting in the airplanes. And then I suddenly, I think, I look back, I see white faces. Now, none of these guys had ever pulled the trigger in war. Well, I was afraid also. And, uh, but the Marine Corps taught you, you never, ever show fear. You have to cope with it. You can't show it. Otherwise, the mission is finished, doomed. So I sat there. And then all of a sudden, I thought to myself, in order to take off, we have to go all the way down to the end of the runway turn, and take off but we only had one tender, one little thing. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, that means four times back and forth, the Egyptians come over, we're finished. I did something totally crazy, but then, you know, you do things, you don't think about it, you have to act instantly. I had them open the doors, we were all sitting in the airplanes, I had them open the hangar doors wide open, we, st I had them st we started the engines in the hangar. One spark and the whole place blows up. Well, we lucked out, zip, 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 zip out. I take off, I do a circle, and then I'm in the climbing turn at about 6,000 feet and Muddy alone is, behind, is below me. We had no radios, by the way, of all things, of course. <laughs> we had nothing. And, and so as I'm turning, and I'd only been in this, in the country, I think, less than a week. We're turning, and I, he realized, he was below me, he realized, it was a climbing turn, he realized that uh, I didn't quite know where Ishdud was. I know it was in the south someplace, but I didn't know where. How, did, how would I know? Mother Alon, oh, God bless him. He just went like this, like this. <laughs> I straightened out my turn, I looked behind and I saw Azer and, and Eddie, and I, you know, I'm, I'm a, born in Hungary, so I'm an emotional character, which my uh, daughter says I'm corny. I says, yeah, but I'm a Hungarian. So what was my emotional thought? I looked back, 
and I saw the people of Israel below me. I was at 6,000 feet. I looked here, and I saw as far as I could see thousands and thousands of Egyptian soldiers, about 500 vehicles, tanks, trucks, everything. And they came to finish the job, by the way. One of the questions that people ask me, because I jumped ahead of it now, is why did I come here? Well, half my family wound up in Auschwitz. That was motivation. I felt the people who survived had a right to some life and a chance of life and happiness. Nobody wanted them but here. And that's the reason I was here on that 29th of May. It was... I truly believe that I was born to be here at that precise moment of history, to be able to contribute to Israel's uh, survival. It was, if it was a day before, it wouldn't have worked. A day after, it would have been too late. That moment. So really, it's, for me, it's the most important thing that I've ever done in my life, and that's what I was born to do. Uh, but let me get to the finish. All right, we're there. See the enemy, okay. Turned upside down, I saw, I saw them at the, at the uh, minaret. They were all gathered there, and you couldn't miss anything. So I just turned the thing upside down because that's the way you, when you dive bomb, I learned how to be a dive bomber before I flew fighters. And I aimed right for the minaret, which is a good point to aim at. And uh, the rest is history. What happened is we dropped our bombs and fired the guns Luckily, we didn't shoot off a prop. And uh, one of the bombs, one of my bombs, luckily hit a fuel tanker. So there was confusion. They didn't know we had airplanes. So there was panic, so much panic, and the place was exploding all over the place. Because then after, as I dove down, I did what we call in the Marine Corps a clover leaf. I stayed down, and I did this turn, this turn, this turn, four turns, firing all the way. And uh, the point of the story is that that night, well, uh, my, uh, my Eddie Cohen got it in the first dive, he was hit. Unfortunately, I wanted him up front, but he wasn't. So uh, it's, it's kind of hard because in a way, I, I felt the responsibility for them, which I never felt in the Marine Corps in the Pacific. I was only responsible for my own life. I was responsible here for three lives. So anyhow, the point is that uh, that night, the, in our intelligence people picked up a message from the commander of the Egyptian, Air for, uh, Egyptian uh, forces on the ground reporting to Cairo, and it's in the history book, and I quote the exact words. He says, we are heavily attacked by enemy aircraft and we are scattering. They never moved one inch forward, they moved east and joined up with the Jordanians around Jerusalem. So it was a costly price, but we stopped them. <laughs>